Welcome everyone to an absolutely gorgeous day on the campus of Notre Dame. I'm coming to you from the main building and our guest today will be coming to you from Bond Hall, originally the Notre Dame Library and then for a long time, the School of Architecture and uh, now home among other entities to the, uh, the Institute for Latino Studies. Um, it's a gorgeous day on campus, uh, believe it or not, after a long spell uh, of, of at least three weeks and, and roughly single digits uh, with about two feet of snow yesterday and today, um, we have had uh, temperatures rise into the 40s. So the snow is melting, the sun is out. Uh, it's uh, symbolic of the, the fact that there is hope on the horizon. Uh, I think we're some 20 days away from spring and uh, we can't wait uh, soon enough for uh, the, 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 the light to continue to grow uh, throughout the day and uh, for the weather to improve. Uh, it's been a tough uh, first three weeks uh, back on campus. Um, we, uh, uh, we are conducting uh, somewhere around 14,000 uh, tests a week, most of those being surveillance tests uh, for COVID. Every student is tested at least once a week. And if there's any cause, like in a particular dorm or area, uh, they could be tested more frequently than that. Um, our uh, seven-day positivity rate right now is at about 1.5%. Uh, we've had um, almost 680 positive cases uh, since we returned uh, to classes uh, at the beginning of February. Um, uh, 560 of those are undergrads. Uh, 59 are graduate and professional students and 57 are employees. Total tests administered to date are, is over 56,000 and about 789 of, the, uh, uh, of the, the tests have been uh, given to people who have been symptomatic and uh, over 55 of the 56,000 have been uh, tested to people who are asymptomatic the, through the surveillance. Um, two thirds, a different twist from last semester, of the positive cases that we've seen have come on campus, not from off campus students, but students uh, residing in the dorms. Uh, as such, uh, we have uh, um, uh, shut down through uh, next week all uh, student activities. Um, are currently being offered virtually uh, because there is a concern uh, to kind of get the, the caseload uh, down as much as pos possible. Uh, it's, uh, it's challenging. Uh, there's no doubt about it, but we've been there. Many schools, this is their first time in, in, uh, in welcoming back their student body or a portion of their student body. Um, we've got some muscle memory from what we went through uh, last semester and, uh, and I think some good learnings to carry forward. So we're confident that we're going to persevere and, uh, and, and, uh, and continue to offer a first-rate education for our students. But uh, to say that it's uh, easy uh, would be misleading. So please, um, we hope to count on your prayers. Uh, we need them and we know that we're not unique. Everybody's feeling this across society as well as all of you. Uh, but uh, hope is on the horizon and better days lie ahead. Today, it's my distinct uh, pleasure to, uh, to interview one of my favorite uh, faculty leaders uh, here on campus. His name is Luis Ricardo Fraga. Uh, Luis is the uh, Reverend Don McNeil, CSC, uh, Professor of Transformative Latino Leadership. It's a great honor to carry uh, Father Don McNeil's name, Luis, uh, who is somebody who is uh, so held in such great high esteem uh, by so many in the Notre Dame family. Uh, Luis is also the Joseph and Elizabeth Robbie Professor of Political Science, and he is the director of the Institute for Latino Studies. In addition to all of that, he is a fellow uh, for the Institute for Educational Initiatives, uh, here at Notre Dame. Luis Hales, originally from Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, he did his undergraduate work at Harvard University, and he did his MA and PhD at Rice University. He's incredibly well credentialed. 
In 2011, President Obama appointed Luis uh, to the President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for Hispanics. And in that same year, the Hispanic business named him one of the top 100 most influential Latino leaders in the country. Um, Luis has actually worked before at Notre Dame from 1986 to 1991. He left to teach and take administrative leadership roles at both Stanford and at the University of Washington before returning to Notre Dame in 2014. So without further ado, uh, let's, uh, let's introduce uh, Professor Luis Fraga. Um, Luis, it's great to be with you. Uh, I've heard that, uh, I've not actually heard the story directly, but I heard the story about your calling to be a professor is quite uh, compelling. Could you share that with us? Sure, very happy to. And thanks very much for the opportunity to be with you, Lou, and for our larger Notre Dame family. I decided to become a professor. I always thought I'd be a lawyer, but I decided I'd become a professor because I didn't have any professors in college who looked like me mm. or had the, any interests in the intellectual things I was interested in, which is the politics of communities of color in the United States. And I thought that perhaps as one of very, very few, in fact, there were 15 Mexican-American students in the entering class of uh, 1973 at Harvard, maybe we had been given that opportunity that would give us a responsibility to try to influence institutions of post-secondary education. I'm the only one who decided to see it that way. I'm the only one who made that commitment. And um, I'm, I'm blessed to have been supported throughout my career by all sorts of different people in being able to uh, move ahead and being able to have a set of experiences and most importantly, being able to make contributions to every university that I've been affiliated with. Um, that decision was one of the wisest decisions I could make. And it was so wise that it not only brought me to Notre Dame, but my older son, Bernard, who went to Stanford as an undergrad and was actually my student there and uh, got his PhD from Harvard, is now also a political science professor. And he's at Emory University as of this fall. Fantastic. Well, well you know, we're, we're blessed that you received that calling uh, to be a professor, and uh, we are the beneficiaries of it here at Notre Dame, and uh, first and foremost, your students. And I know the, the reason why we uh, postponed uh, the, our, our interview till one o'clock today is because you were just uh, finishing up your class on, on uh, uh, transformative Latino leadership. More specifically, Luis, what called you uh, to come and be a faculty member at Notre Dame and then after going off uh, to Stanford and the University of Washington, uh, what made you come back? Well, my early experiences, my earlier experiences, my first set of experiences at Notre Dame was extremely positive. Lovely people, tremendous support for me personally, tremendous support from the deans, from the provost. I felt very, very comfortable here, but I decided to see what it would be like to be somewhere else. Did that for a long time. And I realized that I missed being at a post-secondary institution, being at a university where I could live my Catholic values in the classroom, as well as in my personal life mm -hmm. and pursue in my research and my teaching Catholic values. And I know there are a lot of disagreements as to what the right Catholic values might be and so forth, but the ability to raise questions about what is justice, Mm -hmm. and what is equality, and what is fairness, and how does this relate to the gospel? Just, you can do that at Notre Dame mm -hmm. in a way that you can't do anywhere else. And I wanted to use then the breadth of, exper of the experience I had at other institutions to see what contributions I might be able to make at Notre Dame. In a sense, put me in a better position than I was early in my career to be, to, grow mm -hmm. the institution in mm -hmm. ways that I think make it an even richer and stronger institution than it already is. And to be able to, to work 
at a place as a professor with, in a way consistent with your values, to be able to pursue research and teaching and administrative work consistent with your Catholic values uh, th th doesn't happen all the time. And it has been an absolute blessing for myself. It has been a blessing for our family. And, and you know, I would say similar to Tom Burrish, who came back to his alma mater, in this case, uh, as kind of the capstone of his career, the last 15 years of his career. You know, you've had rich experiences at two wonderful institutions uh, outside of Notre Dame as, as a professor and as an administrator at Stanford and University of Washington. Aside from kind of the Catholic nature, which kind of um, gives you even a broader perspective, what would you say um, in all candor that makes Notre Dame distinctive to those other experiences? What I found when I came here the second time and when I interviewed and when I spoke with Tom Burrish and spoke with Father John, spoke with faculty in the Department of Political Science and spoke with the leadership, Jose Limon and Tim Matovina of the Institute for Latino Studies at that time, I found that Notre Dame was so aspirational. It wanted to become an even better and important and bigger player in many different areas of university life, intellectual work, among Catholic universities, of course, but among all universities. And um, that chance at aspiration and to contribute to that aspiration and the realization mm -hmm. of that aspiration was just so attractive. Combine that with a Catholic component, combine that with the opportunity to help the university move forward and um, see what I could do Mm -hmm. to help the university move forward to be even better, more financially secure, more um, inclusive than it might have been already was just a, an absolute blessing mm -hmm. and challenge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since I'm, I don't like to say this, but since I'm, I don't know, maybe five or 10 years away from the end of my, of my career, mm -hmm. um, and an absolutely magnificent way to grow still mm -hmm. as a person, but try to see what I could do to leave a legacy behind. That's terrific. I, I've heard uh, people say that uh, to experience Notre Dame in many ways as a faculty member, as a graduate, um, as a student, that the best way is to be a Notre Dame parent. <laughs> um, and you had the, the privilege of having uh, your daughter graduate from Notre Dame in 2010 how would you say for you and Charlotte, how did that change or enhance your perspective on Notre Dame as a parent? Yeah, you know, when, when our daughter Isabel decided to um, attend Notre Dame, I was thrilled. You know, we, we hear about many Notre Dame parents just being absolutely thrilled that their children are gonna come here because you know they're gonna be challenged in their values as well as challenged in their intellectual work and so forth. And, we were, and were you living in Seattle when she made that decision? I was living in Seattle at that time. And, and what was beautiful, was I at Stanford? I think I might've been at Stanford. Okay. But what was beautiful was to see Isabel grow mm -hmm. and to see how much she identified with the institution. And when she decided to participate and was accepted to participate in our ACE program, Alliance for Catholic Education program, and was uh, located in Dallas, my home state of Texas, right? Mm -hmm. It was placed there in Dallas. Um, I, and, and to see that she's still there working just outside Dallas in Plano, Texas, I, I saw how a Notre Dame education helps your children grow and how they can internalize the best of what Notre Dame has to offer. Mm -hmm. She's still teaching as a third grade school teacher at the Prince of Peace School in Plano, Texas. Um, Catholic education is her career. Uh, she did the ACE program, then she did the Remick leadership program to become an administrator at some point in a Catholic school. And um, I learn from her every day. I'm inspired by her every day. Um, we talk or text almost every day. And um, I couldn't be more thankful to Notre Dame, to the ACE program, uh, to the Remick leadership program and to Isabel for mm -hmm. helping me even more deeply understand. She was an RA in Lewis mm -hmm. when her senior year to more deeply understand how meaningful the Notre Dame experience can be for our students. I couldn't be prouder as a parent. Oh, that's fantastic. 
Um, you served, uh, as we mentioned before, you actually served as the commissioner of the Presidential Advisory Committee on Educational Excellence for Latinos um, under the Obama administration. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? What did that encompass? And were you able to achieve something through that commission that you feel uh, particularly proud about? Yes. Um I was uh, fortunate to have the opportunity to join an advisory commission, and I was actually co-chair of the post-secondary education subcommittee. And um, you know, I, I study politics, and educational politics is one of the things that I study. So this commission is advisory to the president, advisory to the secretary of education as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't sure exactly what it was because you know many of these commissions are just symbolic and yeah. just you know reward people or make them feel good or show that the White House is reaching out to certain constituencies. I decided that I wasn't going to do that. And the president told us he didn't want us to do that either. So I convened with my um, co-chair, Lisette Nieves from New York City, uh, we convened a series of discussions where essays written by scholars were assessed at broad public meetings by educational advocates, people working in educational advocacy in state capitals around the country and in Washington, DC, and by educational practitioners to try to come up with an agenda as to what the most important issues are that the White House should consider with regards to the future of Hispanics, Latinos in uh, educational policy and what it is that the federal government can do. Well, I learned two things, primarily. One, rarely were there opportunities for scholars, advocates, policy advocates, and practitioners to come together, mm -hmm. to learn from each other, mm -hmm. to hear each other, to hear about each other's work, and to improve upon each other's work and broaden each other's horizons as they pursue the very important responsibilities that they have. For the scholars, it broadened their you know, um, research agendas, for the advocates, it gave them perhaps some new strategies, and for the practitioners, they were able to be better informed as to what some of the best practices and best principles were, but also, if you will, school us in what was really important. That was my idea. Mm -hmm. it was my idea to bring those different constituencies together, and I said, let's learn from each other in a way that doesn't happen. Very. Everyone who participated said, we don't have this, we need more of it. Mm -hmm. The second thing I learned was, even though you have a great idea, a great plan, like I just said, there's a little thing called politics that can make it difficult to be implemented. Mm -hmm. I thought once we did this, we would be able to then take it to the appropriate education committees in the House and in the Senate. I thought we would be able to get the support of the White House to do that. And uh, it kind of happened a little bit. But, you know, there are White House priorities, there's the politics of re-election, there's what the agenda of the White House already is in these particular areas. So it showed me the need to continually work, mm -hmm. continually work to try to get what I thought were new and innovative ideas and move them forward. Mm -hmm. What we were able to do, in other words, was to set a standard for what a commission like this can do. Mm -hmm. but also better strategize future members of such a commission as to how they might try to influence the policy process more directly. Mm -hmm. So I, I heard you use the term Hispanics, Latinos. Can, can you give us a, a distinction, a definition for those of us uh, who are trying to kind of make our way? What yeah, is the sure. difference between Hispanics, Latinos, and Latinx, which <laughs> seems to be kind of an emerging okay. term? Okay. For Hispanic and Latino, it's personal preference. That's all it is. And what I advise people to do is use the term that you think your audience is most comfortable with. That's why I like to use both. Okay. Some people like one, some people like another. In fact, a larger percentage of people, about 45% prefer Hispanic, only about 15% prefer Latino, which is interesting because that's the term that's used more in academia and by the news media. Yeah. Um, and a little more now by politicians as well. And the other remaining percentage don't care which term you use. Mm -hmm. It's the same. When you're using a pan-ethnic term to try to be inclusive of all Latinos, and you know not all Latinos are the same, 
you know, they're people of Mexican origin and Cuban origin and Central Americans and South Americans, and it gets, you know, complex pretty fast. But 62% of all Latinos are of Mexican origin. The second largest group are Puerto Ricans at about 9%. Wow. So you've got this large group, and then you've got other smaller groups, but combined, it's that. Latinx is a new term that just came out in the last several years as a result of advocacy that people who say Latino, Latina, or Hispanic which kind of suggests a sexual binary, male, female. Latinx is a term that's used by people who acknowledge that sexual binary, mm -hmm. but also want to have a term that might include people from the LGBTQ community, lesbians, gay, bisexual, trans transgender, and questioning folks. It also is inclusive of people who don't identify with any particular gender or don't identify as okay. lesbian or gay. And it allows what I like to think of as a, a, a fully inclusive term to talk about the diversity that exists within any community, in this case, an ethnic community, ethnic slash racial community in the United States. Oh, that shed some light on things for me. I, I you know, I thought that uh, his, Hispanic was kind of a, a term of yesteryear and Latino was kind of the new and appropriate term, but it's interesting that 45% uh, of, of those who are Hispanic prefer that and only 15% Latino and the rest don't care. That's an interesting construct. Now, we hear so much about uh, how the um, Hispanic Latino population is growing to be a larger and larger share of the U.S. population. And within Catholic circles, uh, we hear about how it is growing to be a larger and larger percent of the U.S. Catholic population. Can you give us a snapshot on both of those fronts? Where are we today and where are we going with the growth of the, uh, the Hispanic Latino populations uh, in both uh, our domestic society as well as in the church. And what are the ramifications of that? Yeah, absolutely, Lou. Thank you very much for asking that question. There's a lot of misinformation out there as to what to mean. About 18% about of the American population right now, some put it as high as 20%, would self-describe themselves as somehow Hispanic, Latino, Mexican, Mexican-American. These are people living in the United States. Mm -hmm. And you throw in the 3.5 million people living on the, uh, in the territory of Puerto Rico. So it's about 18 to 20% of the American population. population. That number is expected to go up. Maybe as much as 32%. Uh, these are speculations based upon um, current um, birth rates, current immigration rates and current death rates. So if there's fluctuation in those three assumptions, mm -hmm. it might vary a little bit, but it's expected to go up to be maybe as much as 32% of the population in 2050. And certainly by 2025, 2030, 2040, 25%, one out of four of Americans will be Latino. Since the decade of 1990 to 2000, Lou, most Hispanic Latino population growth in the United States has been of US born Hispanics, mm -hmm. not immigrants. In fact, a figure that is rarely used and known, absolutely true, people have verified this, of Latinos under the age of 18, right? So just before adulthood, 94%, 94, 94 94% are born within the United States. Hmm. What that suggests is that the future population growth of this community is of U.S. born citizens, mm -hmm. of Americans. Mm -hmm. Immigration is important, but not as important to population growth as continued birth in the United States. So 20 percent overall in the nation. In the Catholic Church, it's between 35 and 40 percent. Double. Today. Today. Double. Today. Right now. Of those who consider themselves Catholic, who would, who would on a survey say, I am Catholic, right? Mm -hmm. But how practicing they are and so forth, you know, is a, is a more interesting and complex question. But of those who would say they're, they are Catholic, 35 to 40 percent, and that's growing substantially. If you look at the number of baptisms, if you look at the number of first communions, you can see that Latinos are very, very substantial percentages. Some put it at even over 50% mm -hmm. of the growth in uh, Catholics, self-identifying Catholics in the United States. Don't get me wrong. 
Catholic identification in the United States is going down. Mm -hmm. Latino identification as Catholics is going down. But Latinos as a percent of those who identify as Catholics is going up. Mm -hmm. So we're following a nationwide trend, a trend in Europe, a trend in Latin America, a trend everywhere among Catholics that, except in Asia and in Africa. But here in the United States, the future of the Catholic Church is already there. Mm -hmm. And the future of the country is already there within our church if we learn how to grasp it, embrace it, and use it as a way to move Catholic institutions, our Catholic church, forward in a way I think that allows us to truly live the gospel in a way that many of us aspire to do. Fascinating uh, statistics and trends. Uh, Luis, would it be fair to say that if Notre Dame is going to continue to be a Catholic university, it must become a more Latino university? Um, for us to stay Catholic, we're going to have to welcome more Latino students in years to come. How has that changed since you've come back uh, to the university in 2014? And where do you see that going as we move forward? And some of that belies the importance, I think, of the Latino Institute. Yeah. Um, our numbers of students who say they are Hispanic or Latino or someone, any, any one of the subgroups, goes up every year, Lou. We're now at about 15 to 17% of each entering class. Mm -hmm. It was much lower when I was here in the late 80s and early 90s. And that number is going up in part because of class advancement, right, um, in the Latino community, but especially because of just what we talked about just a minute ago, general demographic growth, mm -hmm. and especially because of the desire by many Hispanic, Latino, Latinx families to live the American dream, mm -hmm. to push their children to use education as a way to allow them to realize the sacrifices, whether it was great grandparents or grandparents or parents, right? As happened with the Irish, as happened with Italians, as happened with Poles, Czechs, and other Catholics in earlier periods of immigration across yeah. generations, to be able to have full opportunity to be able to realize their full potential mm -hmm. in the United States. I've been extremely impressed with Notre Dame's outreach mm -hmm. to Latino communities. Every university can do more. We do quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I've been impressed with the students who we admit. We don't just admit my children. Mm -hmm. We admit first-generation children. Mm -hmm. We admit undocumented children. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say children, students. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of my daughter, I'm thinking of children, right? right, um, right. We admit undocumented students, we admit DACA students, we admit first generation students, we admit third generation mm -hmm. Notre Dame Hispanic students. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to be sensitive to both the growth and applications overall and to our original mission to be an institution of first choice for first and second generation Catholics with high aspiration. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful, beautiful to be part of that. And certainly our Institute for Latino Studies and one of the chairs that I hold, the Chair in Transformative Latino Leadership is part of that effort to make sure that our students are given not just support, not social services support, but intellectual support, mm -hmm. intellectual power, classes, mm -hmm. research, high expectations of what they can be as leaders on behalf of Latino communities, working on behalf of Latino communities. And what I found just absolutely fascinating is that this is an interest, not just of Latino students, that's interested in Latino studies, for example, it's an interest of students of all different backgrounds at Notre Dame. You go to one of our graduations, we're a supplemental major and a minor, you go to one of our graduations and what you find is a beautiful rainbow mm -hmm. of students from all different ethnic backgrounds, class backgrounds, racial backgrounds, who in Latino studies found something that helped further ground them mm -hmm. at Notre Dame mm -hmm. and enrich their undergraduate Notre Dame experience. Right. We also support graduate students and their own work. So it, there's a lot of work to do, but this is a wonderful place to do it in. And this is all consistent with the university's original mission. Right. 
It's consistent. I, know I, I, I count myself among that, uh, uh, that population, somebody who after graduation lived for five years in Chile in the Dominican Republic and then came back and have bonded and connected uh, with many um, Hispanic Latino members of this U.S. community um, because I feel shaped and formed by much of that Latino Hispanic culture and uh, and and just the the just the outreach, the the warmth, and all that I've learned uh, from the culture and in the many different cultures within uh, the the Latino Hispanic population. But but tell me um, about the Latino Institute here at Notre Dame. What are you doing? One of the things you pointed out is that you as the professor of uh, transformative Latino leadership and Don McNeil's name uh, is you're a face. You are, are somebody that the students can look at and say, this is somebody like me that uh, can serve as a role model and I can identify with. Um, but what more are you doing than just bringing in more Latino faculty to the university uh, to reach students? We have found, and, and I have worked very hard at this, and, and Lou, you have been a magnificent supporter, as has um, the provost, the previous provost, the current provost, and, and Father John. We have positioned ourselves as an institute that since 1999, when it was first established, was brought to Notre Dame and built at Notre Dame out of Notre Dame's understanding of its original mission in the current environment. Notre Dame was built originally to provide opportunities for what? In 1842, predominantly Catholic, mm -hmm. predominantly working class, predominantly immigrant and immigrant origin, maybe the second generation or third generation, students who were denied opportunities at other places. We still serve that role today. Right. We have a lot of O'Leary's and O'Malley's and, you know, Cucciarelli's and, you know, all sorts of folks here, which is beautiful, right? But that group today in American society is largely Latino, mm -hmm. who are working class, first or second generation, and of um, immigrant origin, right? And what the Institute does is to try to focus upon the way in which our students today have an opportunity to become leaders working on behalf of Latino communities at the same time that they pursue their professional ambitions. You don't have to choose between being a high power neurosurgeon and serving your community. Our institute says, do both. Mm -hmm. You don't have to choose between being a high power business person and using your time and treasure to be able to contribute to Latino communities. You can do both and we'll show you how we'll help you do that. We initiated a scholarship program here at the university called the Latino Studies Scholars Program. This is a scholarship program which offers a half Notre Dame tuition, roughly half Notre Dame tuition, right? On a merit basis, not need basis, the student is eligible for all the rest of the need-based financial aid that the university provides all students, right? That's merit-based and open to anyone, mm -hmm. of any ethnic racial background, any class background, if they have shown leadership on issues important in high school, uh, um, shown leadership on issues important to the future of Latino communities in the United States. Mm -hmm. And it started with a grant from a very well-known alum and with your support mm -hmm. and generosity, mm -hmm. uh, Nacho Lozano, it now has grown to have an endowment of about $9.5 million. Um, we're, we think we're gonna be able to offer eight scholarships of this sort, and it's to build a cohort within each class. My goal is $35 million so that we can offer 16 of these scholarships in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And it's to be able to have a cohort of future leaders here in the United States who are focused on the future of the United States. Mm -hmm. and the future of the Catholic Church, consistent with what we just said before. Magnificent students have, been, have come through here. Students whose parents are undocumented, students who are undocumented, students who are third generation Notre Dame folks, mm -hmm. students who are white, students who are Asian, students who are African American. It's been a group of such an interesting set of students who want to consider and ultimately accept the opportunity to become 
part of the Notre Dame family. Latino studies is also a um, supplemental major and a minor. Mm -hmm. We think that through our classes, by that I mean classes taught by our 20, 31 affiliated faculty members who are all full faculty members in their respective departments and schools. Mm -hmm. Um, we impact about 500 students all across the board mm -hmm. every semester. Mm -hmm. And that way of exposing students to what Latinos are and how they work and how they work in collaboration with them, what their aspirations are, what the challenges are that they mm -hmm. face. And for those who are in our, our Latino Studies um, Scholarship Program, students who want to remain leaders mm -hmm. within those communities. It's just a, an incredible opportunity for us. I'll finish. No other university in the country has this. USC doesn't have it, Stanford doesn't have it, Harvard doesn't have it, Yale doesn't have it, Princeton doesn't have it, UC Berkeley doesn't have it. We are the only one in the country that says, we value you, of course, undergraduate students, for your intellectual power and intellectual accomplishments and the things that you've overcome, but we also value you because of what you're likely to give back. Mm -hmm. and to give back to build an even stronger and more inclusive country in the future. That's a magnificent message, which I think more and more students are hearing and understanding and will give them yet another reason to think of how unique Notre Dame is. So when you say that the other institutions, other universities, top universities don't have what we have, you're not saying that they don't have Latino studies programs. They might teach classes of that. What you're talking about is more of the, of the the leadership or formative uh, aspect of the Institute here at Notre Dame, is that correct? That's right, but I also mean something else consistent with what I said, Lou. Here at Notre Dame, the Institute for Latino Studies is fully aligned with the original mission of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. That's not the case at many other places. Mm -hmm. Latino studies programs or Hispanic studies or Mexican American studies or whatever, largely resulted as a result of student protest. Mm -hmm. now, we have our history of student protest as well, but here the university said, this is good for all of us. This is good for the entire institution. And that puts us in, I think, a very different position mm -hmm. to know that in doing good work here, we're doing good work for the institution as a whole. And I feel, and I think many of my colleagues affiliated with the Institute feel that the university understands that, internalizes that, and um, wants to use that as a way to help the university grow further. So just to underscore a, a little more before we wrap uh, things up, uh, Luis, is um, tell us a little bit more. You shared with us the numbers, the growing impact of, uh, of Latinos on this country and in this church, uh, the Catholic Church in particular. But what is the impact on language in this country, on identity, a changing identity of this country, on purchasing power, on the economy, and on politics, you know, what? how did the Latinos vote? Or do we know yet as they've been able to dissect the last presidential election? It's not a monolithic group, right? There's there's many different groups that, that would fit into Latinos. You, you broke them down from uh, Mexicans to Central Americans to Puerto Ricans, et cetera. Um, what, what can you tell us about the impact across the board? Well, that's a... I give lectures on each one of these topics, so I'm going to try to avoid that and just give you the highlights of, um, on each one. Certainly, the growing presence of Latinos in the United States is something that gives, and especially in the Catholic Church, gives us the opportunity, especially again within the Catholic Church, but in the country as a whole, to see if we can build a better society of inclusion. It challenges us in our fundamental values of liberty, of uh, justice, of equality, and Latinos, in a sense, are at, at the center of that with African Americans and other communities to be able to help us better understand what it is we might want to do in that regard and how to think about that. But the growing presence of Latinos, I think, here at Notre Dame is especially important in helping the university, again, stay grounded to its original mission to not just be another very successful, very selective, highly productive university, but to also be an institution that understands its larger social responsibility, 
Mm -hmm. and if you will, corporate responsibility, but especially its spiritual responsibilities mm -hmm. help to contribute to how it is that we understand things. In politics, Latinos continue to grow as a percent of the electorate. They're not monolithic, but they're more monolithic than not. Mm -hmm. We have Cubans who are a little different in this election. There are a few counties in South Texas that seem to be a little different, but overall, Latinos tend to be Democrat by about a two to one, three to one margin, although it gets as high as six to one and seven to one in states like New Jersey and New York. So you have to do a geographical analysis in addition to the ethnic racial analysis. And you know every election can be different. It depends on who the candidates are right. and how they understand themselves. Latinos are about 50% of all growth in the American domestic consumption market. That's the reason that you get ads in Spanish. That's mm -hmm. the reason that you get Spanish television having more and more ads from American companies. They're the future. No, they're the present mm -hmm. in terms of growth right now. Also contributing to 50% of the growth in the domestic labor force mm -hmm. in the United States. So if you want your company to grow as a result of the labor that it needs, it depends on the company, of course, but mm -hmm. you can look to Latinos to be more and more among those who are qualified mm -hmm. to be able to lead uh, and work within your companies. So in economics, in politics, in population, but especially in expectations that we have of ourselves mm -hmm. as a church and as a nation. I think Latinos have a lot to help us understand. Terrific answer, Luis. Uh, you know, maybe one final question, and that is uh, how can we help you take the Latino studies um, a program here at Notre Dame to the next level. Uh, what are your dreams and aspirations for the Institute for Latino Studies here at Notre Dame? Well, certainly my aspiration is to have, you know, faculty who continue to grow and uh, departments, some departments have been very supportive. More students who are interested in this, whatever their ethnic racial background, whatever their class background. But, you know, we are distinct as an institute in that we did not get established on the basis of a founding donation. Mm -hmm. And so we're in search of that founding donation, a naming donation right. that will allow us to do this work, not just for the next year, two years, three years, through the next budget cycle, but in perpetuity, mm -hmm. in perpetuity, as is appropriate, I think, and necessary at this point. You know, and, and you know, that's in the neighborhood of $20 million or so. Mm -hmm. We already have an endowment toward that end of about five to six million dollars. Mm -hmm. Just trying to supplement that to be able to have the resources that we need to do what we do now and to be able to grow. We're especially growing in the area of programs related to Hispanic ministry, ministry mm -hmm. in the US. I would also like to grow our Latino Studies Scholars Program, that nine and a half million dollar endowment that we already have out of the generosity of Notre Dame alums and parents. I would like to grow it to 35 to be able to have 16 students every year. Imagine. 16 students, one, two, three, four, 16 freshmen, 16 sophomores, 16 juniors, 16 seniors, 64 students. That's a game changer, Lou. Mm -hmm. That's a game changer for Notre Dame. That's a game changer for the country. That's a game changer for our children and our grandchildren, Lou, mm -hmm. who will be in a better position to live lives in a society where everybody has an opportunity to grow and that we might be very proud to leave them. I have two grandchildren now. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't I have know a little that. boy, uh, George Carlos, and uh, just a month ago, another little boy, uh, Patrick Luis. Um, they're born to my oldest son, Bernard. Uh, when I see them, I haven't seen them in person in a while, but when I see them, I haven't seen the little one at all, but when I see them on FaceTime and on, on Zoom, it, it really does inspire you to say, what do you want to leave for them? as a leader. And I think we can all be inspired by what we want to leave our children and grandchildren, which is a society that is richer in understanding, richer in justice, richer in spirituality than maybe we are right now. Well, I, I we were really blessed by your leadership, Luis. Uh, thank you for sharing with us your vision uh, for the Institute for Latino Studies here at Notre Dame. Uh, thank you for your insights uh, uh, a bit into what's going on in our nation uh, as this uh, very important population continues to grow. 
and uh, and we're going to do everything that we can to help you uh, grow this institute and have the kind of in impact and the legacy that we want to have, uh, not only here at Notre Dame, but uh, as we leave our imprint on the rest of the, the nation and world. So thank you so much. Next week, uh, we're going to be joined again at noon uh, by uh, Ann Firth, who is the chief of staff to the president. She's the power behind the throne. Uh, she oftentimes plays a, a background role to Father John, and you're going to get a chance uh, to, uh, to see her and uh, meet her uh, up front and personal. And as we always do, and I'm a little uh, trepidatious right now because last week uh, I mind blanked, and for the first time in a year, I did not uh, complete uh, the Hail Mary. Um, I'm going to, uh, to need your help uh, today uh, from wherever you are and that I can make it through. I, I've never been nervous about this before, but I am today. So please uh, join me in offering a Hail Mary uh, for all those who are suffering in our society, all our students here at Notre Dame, all of your needs uh, as members of the Notre Dame family as well. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Made it through. I didn't stumble on sinners. Many of you pointed out in emails that there was something uh, Freudian about me uh, struggling with whole sinners uh, line last week. Uh, thanks for your feedback, as always. Uh, take care. God bless. Go Irish. Thank you again, Luis.